So, my name is Kate Hickey, I'm with AppGeo. Um, I've been doing strategic planning for over a decade, and I wanted to take some time today to just look at the yellow brick road a little bit closer and um, talk about some stories that, uh, that I've seen and, and heard from the field, too. So, um, you know, Bill gave us a lot of great advice, uh, inspiring talk about why to do a strategic plan. Uh, there are a lot of practical reasons too, you know, often a plan is just used as kind of a checkbox to obtain funding or to justify funding. Um, it certainly sets out a lot of measurable goals that someone can achieve and that's all good, right? But really for, sorry, it's advancing. Um, for it to be meaningful, for a strategic plan to really take root, what we need to do is focus on the planning, not the planning. So, I stole that. I already uh, stole my own thunder here, but I stole that from Dwight Eisenhower here. I just want to make yeah. one brief point of oh, information, of which is, as we have found, New York City does not have a GIS strategic plan or anything resembling it. So with that, I'll go back to you. So that's the concept. Yeah, of course. Um, and you know, Eisenhower and, and uh, um, you know, he was the first to sort of shift the emphasis to the verb, not the noun. Planning is everything, the plan is nothing. And then Simon Sinek, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Simon Sinek, but I uh, strongly urge you to, to listen to some of his talks. Um, but in reality, most plans are rendered useless almost as soon as they are put in motion. So um, maybe everything Bill said is you know, useless here. Why should we put together a plan? But you know, the, the reality is that, that most plans really, um, you know, they, for them to, to take value, you, you really do need to shift this focus. And their point is really not that we should throw the plan out the window. Their point is really that you know, for an organization that is truly embracing change here, that you know, the plan itself cannot possibly contain all of the details that you're going to encounter. All of those unanticipated challenges that are going to happen along the way cannot be documented in a single plan. There's just absolutely no way. And so, you know, it's really a dynamic process. So I might argue that the, the yellow brick road there is really a cyclical process that needs to be re-examined um, periodically. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how we do that planning and sort of how you set that, that cycle in motion there. So we've you know, we have the Wizard of Oz, we have hiking trails, we have icebergs here. If we think about this as a strategic plan, you know, the, the top here, a, a, a successful strategic plan really establishes a clear vision. It's that, that visible part above, above the surface that everyone can point to, everyone can see. What should our strategy be for the next five years? This is clear and concise and, and is used to inspire. Probably the more important part it's a, that is essential, but probably the more important part is all of the messiness that, that sits below the surface here. All of those details about staffing and organizational structure and technology and data, you know, that is where all of those uh, unanticipated challenges lurk there below the surface. If you do successful strategic planning, what you're doing is setting yourself up with a structure that allows you to deal with those challenges as they occur over time. You're building yourself a tool, not a plan that lays out every single brick of the path, but a tool that allows you to be flexible and allows you to adjust and react and plan for, for what's going to happen. So, in my years doing strategic planning, I, I've seen a lot of patterns as well. Um, I wanted to share with you very briefly today what I, in my opinion, think are the five most important elements of doing this process. So first of all is really engaging your stakeholder community. These, these are both from workshops that I facilitated. Um, over here on the left was just a couple of weeks ago out in Sacramento, California, working with Cal Fire. I'll tell a little bit more about that later. Um, this is a workshop with, uh, we were doing for the National Address Database Summit, um, bringing together stakeholders from lots of different organizations uh, to, to come together and come to agreement on a National Address Database standard. So, you know, really the, the key part here is capturing those varied perspectives and really facilitating an open and participatory process. So, 
the key there is truly engaging them. It's not just holding a meeting and doing a survey and checking the box. Yep, we asked everyone what they want. Let's move on. It's truly getting them to think about it, to get their buy-in in the process, to get them to think beyond, you know, what's the licensed version that I need, what's the tool that I need, to really think what is the most important thing for my organization. And, and through this process, they can do that. Um, the other, the, probably the most important question before you even start this is, you know, who are the stakeholders that need to be in the room? I mean, you all, if New York City were to embark on this, would need to be in the room. But whose perspectives are missing from this room right now? If we were to conduct a strategic plan, who, who would we not be hearing from? So I think that's, that's a really important consideration. Next is to take that hard look and, and honestly assess where things are. So using a, a classic SWOT analysis is a really useful framework and tool. This is, this is nothing new. It's been used by many, many organizations. But looking at your strengths, you know, and, and, and looking at them honestly, understanding, and, you know, New York City has tremendous strengths, uh, you know, with the, the talent that you have and the technical capabilities that you have. But there are also some weaknesses, you know, is, is coordination at its best in the city right now? Um, you know, that, does it have what it's need? what you need. Uh, you know, strengths and weaknesses tend to be internal. Uh, that's an assessment of, of what's going on internally within the city. Uh, externally, you know, looking at opportunities that the city might have. Uh, these could be things like a federally um, a funded mandate that comes, you know, like broadband is a good example. It's an opportunity for entities to, to hook into a funding resource that can really uh, launch their program and bring visibility and bring importance. Uh, you know, an event is an external opportunity too. Or a threat. You know, these can, these can be negative as well. So a threat could be um, something political, it could be something technological, it could be, you know, the, the software that um, is being used throughout the city is going to have some game-changing uh, version uh, change and it's going to uh, disrupt a lot of workflows. Uh, another threat can be, you know, getting those calls from the governor can be a threat to your program. If you, if you have a plan in place saying, you know, this is what we're going to do, this is how we're going to prioritize our time, and then someone comes in and says, oh, no, you're not. You're going to spend 25% of your time working on this new endeavor. So, you know, every strategic plan I've done goes through this process, and it can be hard to look at at those negative aspects, but there's no way to really think about the work that needs to be done until you do. And, and Bill certainly talked a lot about this, but articulating that strong vision, articulating that, you know, what does the, the Emerald City look like up there? What does that, that part that's above the surface of the iceberg, what does that look like? Without that vision, no, nobody can agree on where you're going. And no one will join you. I mean, I think that's the big takeaway from Bill's point there. Without, a, uh, without, without that vision, no one will, will jump in and join you in that process. Number four is, is one of the hardest things. I and mean, once that vision is established and, and you go through the process of identifying those key programmatic goals that are going to support, they are going to take you step by step to the Emerald City, you have to prioritize those. Not everything can be done at once. Um, you know, which are the ones that are going to lay the foundation for further development? Um, which are the ones that are going to be highly visible and might garner support from someone really important and vocal that could, could uh, join in, in support for your program? So that prioritization process is key. And then, you know, I would say number five is probably the most important, and it's it's truly accepting that this progress will never be done and preparing for that reality. This is not a, a linear, you know, start, stop, we're done, check, we're, we've got our strategic plan. This is an ongoing assessment. It's an ongoing process. And I, you know, I don't know the city as well as, as you all, but I would venture to guess that that is what's been missing here in New York, is that continuous assessment of where are your strengths, where are your weaknesses, where is your next opportunity or threat. 
And this is an example from Washington, D.C., where um, it's just a simple table, you know, lots of technology can support this exercise, but really looking at those programmatic goals and truly assessing, okay, uh, how far along are we? Are we making progress or are we not? Um, have we been derailed? Is it even important anymore? Um, it could be that it's not important. There can be things like, um, you know, there was uh, early on in strategic planning a lot of emphasis on, you know, building internal IT infrastructure to support a GIS program. And then with the cloud, you know, a lot of those infrastructure investments were, it basically obviates the need for, for those investments. And so, you know, sometimes uh, that, that can be reassessed and maybe don't make as much progress, but it's for good reason. So, speaking of Washington, D.C., um, I wanted to tell two stories, two strategic planning stories, starting with Washington, uh, another, uh, a lot of commonalities here in New York, another big city, uh, lots of politics at play here, uh, high-performing system, lots of eyes on the system, um, and uh, they have a really unique story to tell. So, GIS has been around since the, the, the 90s in D.C. Um, the, the formal D.C. GIS uh, program was established in 2002, and they have a long history of providing services to all the departments in the district um, with citizens. They have great relationship with the local businesses. Um, and really what they have is that they operate as a federation of departments. So the D.C. GIS is here at the core, and then they have this uh, relationship with the, the federation with these departments out here where there's this interoperability that it, it basically supports this data sharing and interoperability between all of the departments and those departments are responsible for their authoritative business data for sharing that back to the to the core and um, and then they receive some of the common uh, the, the common products from the centralized GIS. So from there, there's uh, data infrastructure, there's licensing, there is uh, base data. You know, those things that would be duplicative investments across the departments are handled centrally. But there's no attempt to sort of take over what these different departments are doing. It's just the establishment of a, a formalized relationship between them. And it works out uh, quite well for them. They're a thriving uh, program. They have uh, an enviable master address repository. This is phenomenal. They um, maintain basically standardized addresses and create and, and uh, support this web service that allows every department and externalities to, to plug in and use standardized addresses. Um, they launch and support many map services. They have a really active uh, GIS steering committee that's open to the public. So they um, have formal meetings, they have a formal governance structure in that GIS steering committee, and their meetings are incredibly well attended. I mean, they, they similar function to, to Gizmo here, but with a little more formality. Um, they have uh, small businesses that come in, they have um, almost every department is represented, and there's a, there's a formal designation to each of the uh, departments, and they, they have a lot of communication going on. So what's their secret weapon? How, how are they doing all of this? You know, the, there's, nothing, um, that, there's nothing on that list that, that New York couldn't do. But they do have a secret weapon, and it sure doesn't look very exciting with this graphic here, but believe me, it's very exciting. Um, what they are using, they've embraced the notion of portfolio management. Again, it doesn't sound very exciting, but this was borrowed from, it's a concept that's been used in finance and in IT for, for many years, but this was the first example of a geospatial organization adopting portfolio management. And the, the concept is really quite simple. It's, you know, on a regular basis, GIS investments and platforms are basically classified into plan, build, maintain, or retire. And, and all of the assets and the platforms are viewed through that lens on a regular basis. And I would argue that the most important one is this red one back here. I think that is the greatest weakness of most geospatial organizations. 
is that they are burdened, this echoes a lot of what Bill was saying, is they are burdened for a very long time with legacy applications and support for those, with legacy workflows, with, with things that are really no longer serving the organization anymore, but are they're consuming a tremendous number of resources. And, you know, easy to have this simple graphic up here and say, sure, just retire them. You know, there's, there's no assumption that it's simple to let those things go. But through a strategic plan, you can at least set in place a structure, an organizational framework that allows you to prepare for that retirement so that, you know, you can begin to understand, okay, what's hooked into this? What, what would be the impact if we let this application go? Okay, let's, let's do what we need to do to, to move you know, forward with that release. Um, every time I think about this, I think about Marie Kondo. It's a fan here, but <laughs> the decluttering expert of the... Um, but you know, it's really the same concept. You know, move, don't, don't let legacy things suck up all your time. Focus on what's important here and now. And the plan, build, and maintain is what's important. Uh, next, I wanted to shift my attention to, to CAL FIRE. So I mentioned um, I had been out there a couple of weeks ago. We've been working uh, with the organization um, for several months now. And um, it's, a, it's a massive organization with a, with a lot of challenges. Um, it's probably hard to read any of this from back there, but I'll just go through a couple of the numbers. Um, CAL FIRE is a department within the California Natural Resources Agency. So they're a, a single department. They alone have a $2.6 billion annual budget that they are dealing with. Uh, they employ over 10,000 people. They're geographically distributed. They have 234 of their own fire stations spread throughout the state of California. And then through contract, they manage another 568 stations for, for local entities. So there's a lot of operational complexity going on. Um, but the mind-boggling thing is that in, uh, on average, they respond to over 5,000 incidents a year. So I did the math, it's about 16 incidents a day they are responding to across the state. And not all of those incidents are, you know, are, are equal. Some are, some are small and some are enormous. So out here we all heard about the, the campfire that was raging last November. This is some Landsat imagery, um, a shot from November 8th, um, just a few months ago. Uh, just some statistics from the campfire. It, it basically decimated the entire city of Paradise, California. Uh, there were 85 civilian deaths in the fire. Over 18,000 structures were burned to the ground, and over 16 and a half billion dollars and damage. And the thing that, that blows my mind is this all, most of that damage occurred in the first four hours of the fire. Um, you know, the, the, we were in the midst of our project and doing this and, and uh, just talking with the, with the CIO and with his team on the phone during this time, you could see what an incredible impact it was having on all of them. And they have told us time and time again that this event much like 9-11 and, and other events, um, has changed the organization at its core. It's never going to be the same. And they realize that geospatial is, is a big part of their operating reality and a big key to their success. And the urgency for them to align and coordinate um, is, is very high right now. They have big problems. You know, they, they GIS has been around for, for decades in, in CAL FIRE. Uh, it grew up organically in a, in a can-do environment. There are pockets of excellence throughout the, the organization. You know, people see a need and they jump right in and they figure out the technology, they figure out how to do something and they go with it. But they're not coordinating, they're not, you know, they don't have the time, they don't have the, the staff to, to coordinate across these different program areas. So we, we talked to hundreds of people out there, and there's lots of duplication of effort, there's lots of frustration in getting data, um, there's uh, proliferation of applications being spun up and, and put out there for one-time use, 
and then sitting there cluttering up their their um, their systems. Um, you know, it's lack of coordination is really really risky in their business. Uh, you know, you think about those four hours and 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 what can happen if you are coordinated and what can happen if you are not, and um, it's devastating to think about. And that's just present day, you know, they think about what's going to happen down the line too. They think about uh, sensor technology and, and imagery from drones and are they prepared to take in all of this data? Um, you know, they, they're not. They, they want to take advantage of this, it can save lives. It can um, make them tremendously more effective. But right now, they would just get completely drowned in data. Um, their biggest fear, I heard, I heard one, uh, one gentleman tell me about you know, his biggest fear is that there's going to be someone in the field you know, trying to make sense of data that's coming in on their phone and, and perhaps you know, conflicting information that they're looking at. And that person just gets burned right over because they're looking down at their phone and, and not being, you know, they're not being fed what's important at that moment. They're being fed and saturated with too much information. So we have a big task ahead of us. We're, we're writing a strategic plan to help get them on track. Um, you know, they, it's, it's a big, messy, challenging process. Um, they are all in. They're ready to, to embrace change. Uh, they certainly know their business. I'm not, haven't been in the fire business, but but what we bring is is structure to the process. Um, so it's it's really a pleasure to be working with them, um, and and knowing it's going to have an enormous impact on both their planning and on their operations. So you know, just echoing Bill's questions, like I, I'm curious to ask you to all think about, you know, what what does does any of this resonate with those of you in the room? Does anyone think that, that New York City is having similar challenges? You know, what has happened in the last 17 and a half years? Um, have things, you know, diverged? Uh, and is there an opportunity to get, to get folks aligned again? You know, to borrow Bill's analogy there of the, of the summit, um, you know, the, the importance of strategic planning is not about the boots. It's not about planning out, you know, every stream crossing and which rock you're going to step on as you as you cross that, that water. It's about building a, a structure so that you are aligned with your partners as you're going toward that summit. So that you're aware of the risks and the, and the opportunities that you have as you move in that direction. So that you're supported. And, and most importantly, so that you are flexible and can adjust to the changing landscape, can adjust to challenges that occur along the way. Um, you know, that, that's really what strategic planning is to me. So thank you all for your time today.